So let's. Uh, I want to make a couple of announcements before our featured speaker gets up to speak here. We have uh, uh, elected officials. How many people are running for office this year? Here, raise your hand. Uh, running for office, Eddie McCain, District 39, or uh, uh, Senate against uh, 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 the Republicans. 26. 26. Where's uh, Phil? Running for Congress? District 2. District 2. Anybody else running? Okay. All right. That's it. All right. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, Last week, some of you, I want to make this announcement, some of you, we got a call a couple of days ago that WIS aired a story about some visitors here last week that came off a video. And, you know, I, I was kind of shocked. I thought they might actually air a story about the 12-02 property ordinance in Lexington County. But, uh, nope, they didn't. Anyway, uh, we won't, I will talk to them in some fashion to let them know we do a lot of things. This is a nonpartisan group. Uh, First Amendment rights, freedom of speech, uh, as long as we're not hurting anyone else, this is what this is about. And we encourage that. We have to, don't shy away from controversy at all, but this is a forum for that, for open speech and opinion. If we have this freedom, we'll just discuss that. But at any rate, freedom lives here with, the, with this case of mafia group. It lives here in South Carolina. And we have a top law enforcement official with us today. Alan hasn't been back since he got elected. This is the first time to come back as the Attorney General. It's an honor to have him with us. So um, I would like to introduce Alan Wilson, Attorney General for the State of South Carolina. First of all, thank you for having me back. And what I usually tell every group I come back to, especially since the election last year, or I guess the year before last, since hey, Jeff. last January, um, is thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve as your Attorney General. I know in every group I speak to, some people are with me, some people maybe I wasn't your first choice, but we're stuck together for at least three more years, and uh, you're my boss, and I will work very hard to either keep the respect you gave me or to earn the respect, hopefully I will do a good job for you. I'm a human being like every other elected official, going to make mistakes, and that's where y'all come in and uh, to help keep us folks that, are in, that have been given the honor and privilege of working for you in elected office, that's where y'all come in to keep us straight. I always appreciate feedback, and um, uh, so that you think there's something that we're doing that you like, we like to hear it. We want to, we like, attaboys are always nice. Uh, um, also, if we're doing something you don't like, we want to know about it. I can't fix it if I don't know about it. Sometimes uh, you may not know some information I know, and we can, we can educate you, or at least give you our, our perspective and some point of view that you haven't thought about. And, and who knows, maybe you'll, it'll, it'll uh, strengthen your resolve against the position we've taken, or maybe it'll say, hey, maybe uh, the, the Attorney General's office has got it right this time. But uh, I think communication is so important, and so often people don't get communicated with by their government. And I don't want to make that mistake. So I, I just want to thank Steve, or we, where'd you sit? Back, go straight in front of me. Thank you for having me back to the group. I hope this isn't the last time you'll have me. Um, my, my house is a mile as the crow flies from here over on Wilton Road. So these are my old stomping grounds, guys and gals. Um, so um, I just appreciate this opportunity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take just a couple, three or four minutes to talk about some big issues going on. I don't have a lot of time. So I could spend an hour talking to you about the things our office is doing. I don't have that time. So I'm just going to jump into it. Uh, number one, immigration. Um, the federal government, or Judge, uh, Judge in Charleston, it was kind of funny. I was sued along with the governor um, in Charleston District Court, federal district court in Charleston. Yet there's a district court a mile from my office in Columbia. And I'll give you one reason as why we were sued by the federal government and the ACLU down in Charleston. It was Judge Shockers. Um, but they went down there and they got, they, got a, they got up a hearing and the judge threw out several sections of the immigration law that was passed last year. Um, one of the components of the law says that a law enforcement officer um, stop somebody for speeding. You can't, uh, and, and it says if you have beyond, if you believe beyond a reasonable doubt that person might be illegal, meaning they don't speak a lick of English, they don't have any identification, I mean all, all the common sense stuff, then you, uh, that law enforcement officer is empowered to contact ICE or whatever state agency to come deport that individual um, and, and get, get them out. That was struck down, um, I guess under the, the guise of profiling. The irony is, and, and what we're going to do is, we're going, we've already uh, filed suit, and we're going to go forward in federal court. Arizona's a little bit ahead of us, and they're going to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's granted cert, I think, in April, 
So we're going forward with our suit, but we're watching what the Supreme Court does because they're going to answer this very question in the, in the Arizona case. But here's a little uh, hypocritical point that I want to show you. The State Department in this administration has just put out a manual, not just, it's, a manual has been out under the State Department. It's called Consular Access Notification Manual. And what it tells, the, the State Department is telling everyone at the state, local, and federal level law enforcement is if you pull someone or detain someone and you think that they might be illegal, you're required to get a notification of their right to go to their consulate, to their embassy. So you got the State Department, excuse me, you got the Justice Department saying, check this out, you're not allowed to determine if they're here legally or illegally. You have the State Department saying to the law enforcement, to the cop on the street, you have to determine whether they're not here illegally so that you can give them uh, access to their consulate. Uh, to go to their embassy. That that's you know, it, it's it's amazing how the federal government doesn't want you looking at someone's nationality for purposes of deportation, but they want you looking at it for pop, um, purposes of their defense. And I just find that somewhat hypocritical. And that's one of the arguments we're going to bring up when we take this thing forward. Uh, the other thing is voter ID. Um, we have filed a complaint. We are um, challenging the Department of Justice's denial of South Carolina's photo ID under Section Five. Um, the federal government's misused Section 5, and we are calling, we're, we're basically calling on the carpet on it. I know that other states have joined in this. Texas, for one, is calling in. They're basically saying Section 5 under the 64 Voting Rights Act has been misapplied and it's been perverted and it's, and it, and it's, it's, it's bad. It's being, it's being misused by the federal government. Um, Y'all have all heard about the, the voting dead. Um, we're, we're, we've, um, we've got, I've asked SLED to actually go and look in line by line, person by person, the 900 dead people. If you remember the initial numbers uh, that were pro uh, provided to the um, Justice Department were 240,000 people, 239 specifically, were not, uh, were ha had no photo ID, but were registered to vote, therefore they, their rights could potentially be infringed upon. We found out later that 37,000 of the 239 were dead, 92,000 of them were um, yeah, people who went to another state and that state notified us that they no longer live here. They turned in their license and they're now registered in that state. Uh, so you have 92,000 of them. Another 20,500 are just, you know, the guy's name was William Smith on this list and Billy Smith on this list. Same social security, birth date, address, just different first names so the computers didn't check it. Uh, there's one lady on there who was 130 years old. Um, she's been on the smoker's jar a couple times. And so uh, you had about 30 people in Sumter Jail who registered to vote. You had 300 kids, uh, 300 college students in one address and, an, and another. Uh, so this has absolutely nothing to do with voter ID. This is about the integrity of the election process. Voter ID stands whether they find a single dead person voting or not. Um, but we have asked them to look at the dead people voting. I have also asked SLED to look at um, the 90 some odd thousand people who've left South Carolina, uh, registered in another state, but are still in the voter rolls here. And I said, I want to know over the last several election cycles, how many of them voted in, in South Carolina, and I want you to go to the state from which they, from which they currently uh, hail from, and find out how many elections they voted, and see if they're voting in the same two separate states in the same election. I, I'd like to know that. And we could, that, that's a very easy thing. It just, it's very time consuming, 90,000 is a lot. But that's one of the things we're doing with that. But we plan to um, sue the Justice Department on this. Supreme Court has already upheld this for Indiana. Same similar law in Indiana, photo ID. Um, um, in the Indiana case, it was upheld by the Supreme Court, and the Justice Department approved this for Georgia. So there's Justice um, Department approval precedent, and there's Supreme Court precedent. Whether you agree with either one of them on this case, they both said the exact opposite in previous cases. So we're going we're gonna to hold their feet to the fire on that. Uh, let's see, talk about voter ID, immigration, um, I'm trying to think what else is going on. We've got a lot, of, a lot of big cases going on right now. Next month I'm going to be in D.C. with the Supreme Court for the health care arguments. Obviously, I've all heard about the contraception issue. Um, this is my last thought, and I'm going to sit down because I know you only gave me five minutes, and I've all gone over that. The contraception thing makes me sick to my stomach. I think it's disgusting, and I think it's, I think it's, I don't even have the words for it, but I will say this. At first they said an individual that they had an unconstitutional um, mandate and required an individual to go get health insurance to buy a product they may or may not want to enter into a contract with an insurance company. That was, that was strike one. Strike two was, well, we're going to require employers to provide insurance services that they may or may not find unconscionable, that, they may, that may violate their, their religious beliefs. And then in an effort to accommodate, they said, well, we're not going to require the employer to provide um, the insurance product. We're going to require the employer to provide the insurance 
and then we're going to mandate that the insurance company uh, give the product away for free. So what is that? We've gone from requiring people to go into insurance, enter insurance, insurance contracts. Then you've gone into requiring businesses to provide services they don't want, and now you're requiring the insurance companies to give away free stuff. I'm not here to defend the insurance companies. A lot of good ones, a lot of bad ones. But if they can force an insurance company to give away free health care or a free product, they can require Shoney's to give away a free breakfast on the street. They, they can, they can, they can, I mean, there are hungry people out there. We should all, we all have a Christian duty to go out and help them. But you don't have a right to force businesses to give away free meals. And I can tell you right now, I want to teach the Obama administration one, one principle that any D student in Economics 101 in college has already figured out. There are no free lunches. Let's give a round of applause. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping on a conference call after this meeting to meet with several AGs who are we're going to file a complaint on that one too. And um, that those are some three hot button issues. I could go into a lot more. There's a lot of stuff under the surface that I'm dealing with that you don't see. A lot of stuff you will eventually know about. But we, we're 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 in a lot of different things. But I just want to thank you for having me. I don't want to take up your time. So um, I guess people ask questions after she's finished speaking. Well, well, look, look, this, this, uh, do some questions now while you're up here. Man. Okay. Real quick. Uh, how, did, how many elections do you have to miss before your name is removed from the? I believe it's two presidential election cycles. <coughs> to two presidential election cycles. Yeah, but they don't actually do that. Before. No, no. L listen, the system. I've taken the two issues. Is like the folks that are against photo ID, they're going to say if if they find out that the 900 dead people didn't exist, which I'm sure there are quite a few on there. But let's say they that there's not enough on there. I'm going to tell them that that that's a separate issue. That's a, you got an antiquated system where you don't have DMV, the Department of Vital Statistics, the Election Commission, all talking. There needs to be some type of standard procedure whereby the, the list are expunged. And y'all saw the USA Today article, it's like 1.8 million dead people still in the voting rolls. We have to, we have to, up, we have to fix our, our system of voting. That has nothing to do with voter ID. By the way, one add-on. What they don't tell you is if an old person shows up, They've got lung cancer and kidney failure. They don't have a drive. They've never had a driver's license in 92 years. They can still vote. They just have to sign an affidavit under pain of perjury and have a witness that they are who they say they are. And they live at that address, and that way you can track them down in the future. But they well, can still. I, vote. I know. Uh, I, I, I'm a poll sitter, and we had a lot of problems with people coming in saying that they had registered at the DMV. Okay, and. Their name never showed up on the register. And that's um, were these people that you knew, or are they just no, were they they people were, you found I'm suspect? I'm a whole center in a part of town that I don't come from. I, I speak frequently with uh, Director Schwedo, Kevin Schwedo, who's over the DMV, and I'll be happy to bring that to his attention. Um, are you are you thinking that the system's broken at DMV as well? Right, that's where it's broken. Um, okay. The election commission will tell you that you, they're supposed to, the DMV is supposed to notify the election commission. The election commission says, you know, we, we call them. <coughs> you know, nobody says anything to us about the supposed to register or or anything else. You know? mm -hmm. and, and it's supposed to be done automatically. If you go change your driver license to a new address, then they notify the voter registration folks and they send you a new well, well, DMV will claim that they have been notified the election commission. The election commission will complain that federal law doesn't allow them to take people off until those certain criteria are met. It's very, it's very strict and it's, it's antiquated and it's backdated and needs to be resolved. Yes, sir. Right, this is a totally different question. Why can't something be done for the people that are on Medicaid that are getting all this money, spending it on junk food? Why don't we put them to work? Let them do voluntary work to earn what they have. Why don't? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, good question. I mean, I'm, I'm not, a, that would be a, a I mean, that, that, that is a legislative branch. I, I fully support it. I, listen, I have a Medicaid fraud unit in my office. I mean, you won't believe the millions of dollars in Medi Medicaid abuse we, we deal with every year. Um, patient, patient uh, recipient fraud, doctors abusing, um, patients abusing. I mean, it's, it's a hard, the system has got a lot of fraud in it. So. I mean, we're going after them on the law enforcement side, but on the on the legislative side, I would I would stand up next to any member of Congress or House member, a member or senator, and say Amen to that. Yes, sir. Hey, now, my question is: People who are on welfare, unemployed, why can they not be drug tested? Um, when I got my job, 
working for the state. Uh, the first time, not when I got elected. I'm talking when I was an assistant attorney general. I showed up to fill out an application. They said, by the way, you have to go over to, and you have to pee in a cup and get your fingerprint and all that stuff. I was, I was, I was applying to be a prosecutor. But if I go over and I apply to, to receive a government entitlement, a benefit, then I don't have to prove that I'm not smoking crack or smoking pot or whatever. It's, it's funny, the standard, we're, we're making prosecutors and cops submit the drug uh, test to, uh, to enforce the law, but we're not requiring people who are receiving that benefit do the same. But I've, I've never understood why that was, and I've actually asked that question of people, and I'd like to see it change. Who, I guess you say, presents the law, who puts it on the books, how do we get it done? What's the bottom line? We know it needs to be done, how do we do it? Well, you just go to your, your house member, uh, your, your, your state house member or senator, and you ask them to do it, or you go to the one that you have the best relationship with, whether they're yours or not, and you say, hey, listen, this is an idea. And um, you know what I'm going to do? I, I've got a couple friends I'm going to see later today. I'm going to talk to them about that, um, because that's something that's come up a lot. Please do. Yeah, it's but, very but, but listen, I'm going I'm to check on it for you, but, but listen, y'all got as much power as I do because I mean, when y'all come together, talking to these members of the House, they listen to you. I've heard about this breakfast a lot. I mean, y'all are well known. Uh, but what I'm saying is y'all have had Kenny Bing and Rick Quinn and others come here and talk. I mean, seriously, push that issue. Push that. It's a good issue. I agree with you. In, in, well, I just wanted to throw one quick question. You know, we talk about how we have to get Justice Department preclearance on a lot of our voting issues. What steps can we take to ultimately get out of that? Because my understanding is there's only, what, about 11 states that are required to do this via the Voting Rights Act. How does that hold do up it. to one a constitutional, constitutional muster, and, and how could that be ultimately changed, or could it be? Well, he, he wants to nullify it. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's unconstitutional. Uh, there is um, authority in the U.S. Constitution. It, it's, it's, it's the dregs of Reconstruction that are still, yes. yeah. still on. So, so, yeah. so, um, so just don't understand. voluntarily submit to it. That, that, that's that's but that, that's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is, is what we're doing is, is we we have put in our complaint that we find that this voting section five is constitutionally suspect, and we can, if they don't back off, we're going to go ahead and go after them on it. Um, I know Texas is doing the same thing. The states are starting to stand up, and the, fe the federal government is scared to death about having section five taken away from them. I mean, they're, they're, the Justice Department—they're they're terrified. <coughs> Any more questions? Nope. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Well,